explain what we just signed there. <clears throat> no, uh, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for coming here today. It's uh, truly an honor to, uh, to address you here in, in Government House here in, in Alberta, and I'd like to, to thank my, my colleagues from Saskatchewan and Manitoba, from Manitoba, Honorable Doyle Pinyuk, uh, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure for the Great Province of Manitoba, and Honorable Jeremy Cockrell, the Minister of Highways for Saskatchewan, uh, obviously just to our eastern neighbour. And I'd also like to thank Alberta's Parliamentary Secretary for Economic Corridor, Shane Getson. He's here with us as well. And uh, just a historic uh, uh, agreement between Saskatchewan and Manitoba, uh, because Western Canada has long been a robust economic engine in Canada and has established world leader and is an established world leader in many critical economic sectors with extensive natural resources from agriculture to forestry to energy to petrochemicals to minerals as well as manufactured goods Alberta and Manitoba and Saskatchewan have the products that the world needs and all three provinces rely on strong and efficient economic corridors to get these products to market within Canada and beyond that's why today I'm pleased to announce that Alberta is signing a Memorandum of Understanding with Manitoba and Saskatchewan to advance economic corridors between our provinces. In Alberta, we are taking a nation-building approach to economic corridors, looking beyond our province's borders to opportunities across the province, North America, and the world. Alberta has exported about $130 billion worth of products every year, either by pipeline, road, rail, or air. And it's important to note that economic corridors are more than just highways and end destinations. They can involve a broad range of infrastructure, including transportation, energy, power, telecommunications, and other utilities. In addition to physical infrastructure, corridors include service markets and the coordination of regulations and policies across multiple jurisdictions and sectors. That's why coordinated provincial approach to advancing economic corridors is so important. I'm excited for this opportunity for Alberta to work with Manitoba and Saskatchewan to support the movement of products within the three provinces and Western Canada and to markets around the world. Together we will focus on enhancing critical infrastructure that our industries rely on to get their goods to market. A key part of this will to be working cooperatively to reduce red tape and to align regulatory processes. We will also work together to support efforts to improve efficiencies in Canada's ports air, passenger and cargo services, as well as freight and rail services. Now in this MOU, we are also committing to bring forward issues of mutual interest and to advocate to the federal government on shared priorities. For example, this February, I was pleased to have the opportunity to meet Minister Cockrell and other provincial and territorial partners in Ottawa at the annual meeting of the Council of Ministers responsible for transportation and highways. During these meetings, I stressed the importance of economic corridors and Canada being open to nation building projects and making transportation more affordable in Canada. One of the key factors impacting our ability to complete major projects to improve trade infrastructure and access to foreign markets are regulatory delays caused by Bill C-69, the Federal Impact Assessment Act. I know that this federal legislation is a common concern for Alberta, Manitoba and Saskatchewan as well as the four other provinces that actually have joined Alberta in appealing this bill at the Supreme Court. Alberta is committed to continuing to advocate to the federal government to prioritize approvals and the completion of nation building projects to enhance our trade infrastructure. As well, our province will continue to advocate for recommendations from the National Supply Chain Task Force to be implemented as soon as possible. These recommendations can support solutions to current challenges in the transportation industry, including supply chain constraints and labour shortages, which can lead to increased costs for Canadians, particularly those living in rural, remote and Indigenous communities. And finally, I'd like to share that through this MOU, Alberta will work with Manitoba and Saskatchewan to identify opportunities to attract private sector investment and partner with Indigenous communities on economic corridor development. My department is committed to working and proactively partnering with Indigenous communities on planning economic corridors for the mutual benefit of everyone. And I'd like to thank both Manitoba and Saskatchewan for working with Alberta to advance our shared vision of strengthening economic corridors to benefit Western Canadians now and in the future. And I welcome other provinces to join our collaborative efforts to advance economic corridors through this MOU. 
I'm confident that this work will not only create jobs and support our businesses, but will promote significant economic growth in Alberta and across Western Canada. And with that, I'd like to hand things over to Minister Cockrell. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today as the Minister of Highways for the great province of Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan's economy is built on supplying our food, fuel, and fertilizer to partners around the globe. We share our province's bounty with the world, and we do it from a landlocked province in the middle of the Canadian prairies. A safe, reliable, sustainable transportation system isn't just a nice to have in our province, it's essential to our way of life. It's how we compete in a global marketplace, and it's critical to ensuring we continue to have a high quality of life for Saskatchewan people. We ship products and commodities from a variety of sectors, including agriculture, mining, forestry, energy, food and manufacturing. We need timely and predictable access to world markets, supporting our business community and their customers around the world. Now, I'm stating the obvious here, but Saskatchewan doesn't have direct access to ports. Most of what we produce travels south through the United States, east through Manitoba, or west through Alberta and British Columbia. Economic corridors that enable supply chains are our lifeline, and 70% of our province's GDP relies on exports. That's why it's so important that we work together with our friends and our neighbours. This memorandum of understanding commits all of us to supporting the movement of people and goods, it commits us to investing, commits us to finding joint solutions to our challenges, and we will work to improve highways and rail networks across our provinces. We will encourage our federal partners to play their part in supporting infrastructure and protecting the supply chains in this country. And we will work together to encourage capital investment that supports the mobility of people and goods to and through the prairies to customers and consumers around the world. And we will work to harmonize and reduce regulatory burdens to our shippers. Saskatchewan ships products to 165 countries around the world. In 2021, we exported a record $37 billion in goods, and that number continues to climb. That's why Saskatchewan has made record investments in our infrastructure, $12 billion in the last 16 years. We're going to keep investing in our network in Saskatchewan, and we're going to keep working together with our neighbours, Alberta and Manitoba. Together, we can make a Canada that works for all of its people. Thank you. And actually, I'll just ask Minister Pinion to add some comments as well. Thank you. Well, I just, I'm so honoured to be here. I think this is historical to uh, the three of the provinces coming together to sign the MOU to uh, look at transportation corridors. And uh, I have to say, I have to go back to um, our own province's history. You know, we were known as the Keystone Province, uh, Man Manitoba, because we were the gateway for a lot of the stuff that happened in Western Canada. And I believe that this is an opportunity to continue what we're doing right now when it comes to ra railway. It's, we are one of the ma major hubs for na all three na national railways that come through Manitoba. Um, we have the TransCanada and the Yellowhead Highway that connects um, by Portage. It's so important that we invest in our highways, in our, in our infrastructure, when it comes to um, connecting to Alberta and uh, Saskatchewan. And right now, we have actually have a trade and commerce grid that we are connecting. And we just actually had a meeting uh, talk with uh, Minister Cockrell this, yesterday, last night to talk about the opportunities of how we can um, interact with all our, our transportation between our two provinces and, and in connecting to uh, uh, Alberta. And that's also working with Ontario, too. Uh, I think we need to do this all across the country, but this is a start where we look at northern Manitoba, and northern Saskatchewan, northern Alberta for opportunities uh, Working with our First Nations um, for being part of, uh, you know, growing, you know, this is part of reconciliation. This is about doing action. And this is going to be an opportunity to work with our First Nations in all three provinces and throughout Canada. 
Um, I just want to, again, I, I think uh, a lot of my, my two colleagues have said a lot of things about well, how important this, um, the trade is and the amount of uh, goods and services that we come out there. But we want to show also for our province that we're open for business and for industry. And this is why working together collaboratively, we can't stay isolated. We need to make sure that goods and services flow right across the Prairie provinces and into um, your international markets such as Europe and Asia. And this is a great, great day today to actually signing this historical MOU. Thank you everyone for coming. Okay, and uh, with that we will now move to questions from the media. So we will begin with questions here on the floor. Uh, so if you have a question, please come up to the mic here. Also a reminder for those on the line to please press star one uh, to ask a question. Thank you. Hi. I'm not sure if this is on. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's Janet French from the CBC. Uh, my first question is actually for Manitoba Pionyuk. Am I saying your name right? Okay. Uh, can you come to the mic? Thanks. Uh, while you're making your way there. So, our, earlier our Premier had broached the idea of using the port of Churchill as a way to ship oil and gas products overseas. Your Premier had at the time said that this is something she would not entertain. So, does this agreement change anything around that? Would anything in this agreement enable the shipment of oil and gas products out of the port of Churchill? Well, one of the things is with this, um, this agreement is it's, it's, it's the intent. It's the intent to uh, communicate between provinces. And our, the thing is what we need to look at, focus on, is that we do have a railway to, to Churchill already. And it's the Hudson Bay Railway that, you know, it provides grain um, cargo to, uh, to European markets. And, and the thing is, we've invested over $75 million this past year to make sure that it, we upgrade it. And we're working with the federal government, making sure that uh, we have a lot of in, in, um, First Nation communities along the railway line, too. So what we want to make sure is that um, with the goods and services that we provide and, and send out to, to, um, to abroad, we want to make sure that um, you know, we, we collaborate with First Nation communities, we collaborate with the northern communities, and working together and making sure that uh, the, you know, we, we respect our natural resources and um, looking at what the opportunities out there. And we'll, not very it, much clarity in there, though. Oil and gas interested, not interested. Well, that's something that has to be discussed in in, in, in the future. But right now, Churchill, right now, the town, city of Churchill, it's it's, it's a tourist inter, inter, um, destination, has polar bears. There, we were looking at the Hudson Bay in, in total. Like, there's other opportunities out there in in, in the corridors of, of the north, and this is where we, we're going to be working together with the two provinces. Thank you. Uh, my second question is for Minister Dreeshin. So in November of 2021, uh, you had released a statement when you resigned from Cabinet saying that uh, your use of alcohol had become a bit of a distraction for, uh, for the government of the day. And you said that you were taking time to take care of your health and wellness. What steps have you taken since then to address your use of alcohol between now and being reappointed to Cabinet? And um, how would you say your use of alcohol has changed in that time? Well, it's a very interesting CBC question. Um, but I, uh, there's a lot of work going on into this uh, MOU that we're happy to announce with Saskatchewan, Manitoba. I'm personally fine, and I do appreciate that, Janet, for, uh, for the personal question. But no, today is, is a historic day for the province of Alberta. And I know uh, Minister Pignac was talking about economic corridors and, and something that's great about economic corridors is it's not project specific. I know you're kind of asking about what about a specific industry, what about oil and gas. It's an economic corridor can be anything. It can be a road, it can be a utility line from Manitoba west, it can be a pipeline from Alberta east, it can be a utility line from Quebec east, it can be anything within an economic corridor. But right now as you know trying to build any nation building projects and we've seen so many in Canada that have been shut down through regulatory delays, individual private companies saying, you know what, I, we can't invest in Canada because it's taking a decade or more to actually get through a regulatory process. That's, that's just not good enough. And I think we as Canadians need to stand up and provinces need to stand up to say, you know what, we can work with our First Nations, we can work with our provinces, and we'd love to work with the federal government that would actually say we need, the world needs our products, so let's make sure we can have a regulatory process. We are actually open for business and we can, at the end of the day, provide great jobs for 
for all Canadians to be able to support their communities and uh, to have a better quality of life. So that's what this MOU is about, is changing that narrative of Canada is closed for business to Canada is open for business and we actually have levels of government working together to make sure that we can actually advance nation building projects. But so are we thank to you, infer, thank you for that personal question. Are we to infer that you have not changed your use of alcohol in that time frame? <laughs> it's, so to me, I always thought media and news would actually report news rather than just promote a narrative, but you can continue on on this narrative. Well, it is like possible for us to be interested in trade corridors and your personal conduct at the same time. Oh, I, thank you for that personal question. Okay, and uh, we will now move on to uh, questions on the line. Operator, can you please put through the first caller? Josh Aldridge, Calgary Herald. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. This is for uh, Mr. Treason. Uh, when I'm talking trade corridors and uh, your uh, colleague there from uh, from Saskatchewan talked about being landlocked, I can't help but notice that BC is not part of this MOU and whether it's pipelines or just other transport to Tidewater. Uh, without BC being part of this, how, how big of a roadblock, excuse the pun, uh, is this for meeting those objectives that you are setting out in this MOU? Did you reach out to BC on this, or did you try to include them in on this, or was this just more of a prairie effort? You know, thanks, thanks, Josh, for that, that great question. And yes, uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, we, we, are, we are landlocked, and that's why we are looking beyond just the prairie provinces. So yes, we are coordinating, and this is kind of the start of, of being able to collaborate together. And yeah, we are reaching out to, to BC and to Ontario and Quebec and, and to the Maritimes as well. Because in a, in a perfect world, we would have all the provinces coming together, realizing that economic corridors make sense. And, and I know it's, it's been said before of how Canada was really built on a logistics problem. Uh, early on, you had Eastern Canada, the Maritimes, trying to get their products into Central Canada. So they, they sparked the idea of a, a national railroad, eventually connecting all the way out to the Pacific, connecting the Atlantic to the Pacific. So I know as, as, as provinces, we, we need to work together, we have worked together. So that, this is something that we wanted to just build a foundation of, of the Prairie provinces and uh, very willing to, to reach out to, to other provinces as well. Because again, this benefits not just the Prairie provinces, but other provinces as well to be able to build nation building projects all across the, the country. Uh, a follow up and look, I, I know corridors, they're not just about physical infrastructure. I actually talked with uh, former Premier Brian Pallister about this quite a bit. Uh, will there be more of a unification on things like policy and legislation between the three provinces when it comes to transportation and road safety and those types of things, or especially when it comes to the transport uh, with trucks and all the rest? Or is there going to be more work on that where we're going to see a lot more unification on that across the three provinces? Yeah, and I, I can let my, my colleagues take a shot at that too, but I, from Alberta's standpoint, yes. Uh, obviously, there's, there's a lot of truck traffic uh, that crosses our, our provinces. I know even when it comes to, uh, to melt, to mandatory entry-level training, any truck from Quebec East doesn't have that, but yet uh, we have it out west. So we are looking at ways that we can try to, A, increase truck safety, but also make our trucking system more, more efficient. And whether that's you know, industry specific, whether it's be agriculture, uh, transporting livestock, um, trying to find ways where we can, at the end of the day, make sure that trucks are safe, but also that uh, we have regulation that makes sense to, to business and industry that actually use the trucks on, on a daily basis. But I don't know if you guys want to. Just to add on to that question, I know from the Saskatchewan perspective, I mean, certainly, uh, as I said, we. When we look at our network, you know, the highest priority is safety, both for the people uh, moving on that network and then the goods traveling on that network as well. Uh, I know that we have worked with both Manitoba and Alberta in the past in terms of harmonizing some of the regulations. I think we have some more work to do on that and working with Transport Canada as well, uh, again, to make sure that our network is safe, but also that uh, goods can move efficiently. And uh, Minister Dreeshan men mentioned the livestock sector. I think we have some work specifically to do there uh, in terms of some of the new regulations from Transport Canada. But we're going to continue on that work. And this is a great example today of three provinces working together and looking to add more provinces as well to that effort. Yeah, when, 
when it comes to uh, policy and regulations, we are also working hand by hand, hand, to hand with uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta. A lot of times we try to do con uh, consistency so that the industry, especially the uh, trucking industry, that they actually are, are can transport goods and services th uh, throughout the different provinces and have, having sort of the same uh, regulations as right, right across the country. So we are working uh, very closely with our with our part uh, other Prairie provinces, and we'll continue in that. And this is this basically the MOU that we're doing today. Basically says that hey, we're going to keep the communication going, and even more so. And this is why it's so important to uh, again move these goods and services across uh, North America. And uh, we're, that, that's why our commitment is here today. Yeah. Okay, operator, please put through the next caller. Chris Markham, Calgary Herald. Hi, uh, this is a question for all three ministers. Uh, there was some discussion at the beginning of the news conference about the speed of which major projects are approved in this country. Uh, during the federal budget two weeks ago, the uh, Liberal government announced that it's going to unveil a plan to speed up the federal permitting process for major infrastructure projects before the end of the year. I guess I'm curious from each of the provinces, what are you hoping to see? What do you want to see from the federal government as it pertains to that issue? A great question. And... We, we always view that the Federal Impact Assessment Act, Bill C-69, is, is probably one of the biggest hurdles um, at, from a, an Alberta standpoint to try to get projects approved. So, I mean, those, those are, it's good language to hear from the federal government that they're interested in trying to speed up approvals because I think they, they are cognizant of the fact that many projects, billions of dollars worth of investment, thousands of jobs in Canada have been, have been evaporated due to a regulatory process that just takes way too long to get a yes or a no. And so that's, so it's, it's encouraging language to, to hear. I guess we'll, we'll see that the devil's always in the details. Uh, so we'll see what exactly that entails. But we, we from our standpoint, would be a, a full repeal of Bill C-69 would go a long way, A, to speed up approvals, but also to, but also to improve investor confidence. So global capital around the world that's looking for a place to invest uh, sees Canada as a place that it could invest and could create jobs. So that's that's our biggest hurdle that we see right now. But uh, we'll we'll see what more details as they come. But yeah, I'm going to Jeremy. Thank you. I think Minister Dreeshen kind of was going at, at this a little bit. I mean, actions at the end of the day speak louder than words. And so, you know, what uh, what gets said in the federal budget that that was some encouraging language there, but certainly. Uh, what we'd like to see is we'd like to see the federal government repeal C-69, and we'd like to see the federal government roll up their sleeves and get to work in terms of proactively engaging with both industry and provinces to try and get some of, some of these nation-building projects that we're talking about built. That's what is going to, at the end of the day, it's going to create better jobs for Canadian people, whatever province they live in. And uh, that's, I think that's good for our three provinces, absolutely, but it's good for the country in general. So um, one of the projects that we we're working on in Manitoba, we actually, last year, we had the second worst uh, flood in Manitoba history, over $400 million flood damages. And one of the projects we wanted to make sure that the federal government would actually uh, approve when it comes to environmental uh, licensing was the late Manitoba, late St. Martin's outlet channel that we've been working on this for many, many years. And back in 2011 and 14, many First Nation communities along Lake Manitoba were impacted, and Lake St. Martin were impacted and, and, and had to be evacuated from their communities. And we just want the uh, federal government to approve this um, license. It's a $650 million project that would help mitigate uh, flooding in uh, major areas of Manitoba. And the thing is, we want this to, if this can be done, we, we're ready to actually invest over 600, and there's a lot of jobs that's created to, to, to do the project, but it also would save um, millions and millions of dollars in the future when it comes to flood mitigation projects like this one. Thank you. Okay, operator, please put through the next caller. Catherine Grigowski, Alberta Today. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I'm wondering what, if any, discussion you've had about hydrogen shipping within these economic corridors. Uh, again, that's uh, we should have listed that as one of the examples of what could go in an economic corridor, but uh, the answer is yes. Uh, that is something that we're, we're working with with industry to say, you know, what what does obviously does it mean for you know for safety standards, and it's a different type, obviously, of, of pipeline. 
uh, that, that would be necessary. But uh, essentially, the economic corridor is just that, that right of way, that area of, of land across, across provinces, across countries, where you could have any industry be able to, to build and to advance their projects within that right of way. So we, the government, at the end of the day, any level of government won't be building these projects. We'll be working with industry, but we are, we're literally leveling the playing field for industry to be able to build any type of projects, and, and hydrogen would, uh, would definitely be one of them. But again, it would be demand driven. Okay. And um, oh, on the telecommunications front, I'm wondering um, so Saskatchewan has SaskTel, like it's a crown corporation, whereas Alberta and Manitoba have um, private telecom uh, companies. So how does, how does that work? How do you uh, talk to each other when there's, there's both a mix of private and public? Um, utilities in that, in telecommunication. I'll let Jeremy take first crack. Thank you. That's a good question. I mean, in Saskatchewan, we are we're very fortunate to have a number of very strong crown corporations that, at the end of the day, ensure that we have a strong level of service to residents around our province. You know, in, in our crown sector, but specifically SaskTel, we've invested billions of dollars in expanding broadband access all over the province. We're continuing that investment. And I would say as, uh, as you know, not speaking for SaskTel here today, but speaking as, a, as the government of Saskatchewan, uh, we'll certainly make it a priority to ensure that SaskTel is working with telecommunication partners on either side of us and, and elsewhere in the country to, to work together to build some of these telecommunication corridors. Okay, operator, please put through the next caller. Lisa Johnson, Edmonton Journal. <clears throat> Hi, thanks for taking my question. This is for Minister Dreeshen. Um, I'm wondering, back in March, uh, Minister Guthrie was uh, talking in a committee about um, Alberta's current export capacity for oil, um, especially considering when TMX comes online, I think it's expected to come online, um, early next year, he was estimating we'd have about five and a half million barrels of potential expandability, which would probably be good enough for Alberta for the next 10 to 15 years in, in terms of capacity. So I'm wondering if, in your opinion, do we need more export capacity, oil export capacity beyond TMX, or is this the last pipeline Alberta needs? No, we, uh, we need a lot more uh, export capacity. We, we sit on the, the third largest oil reserves in the world and the, the fifth largest natural gas reserves in the world, just the province of Alberta. And and yes, it's you know, TMX, the construction once that's online, that's gonna help us a lot just in that price differential between what, what Alberta oil gets paid and or what it's worth versus um, um, getting it down to the Gulf Coast. But uh, but yeah, we the more export capacity we have, the the smaller that differential gets. So that we, at the end of the day, will be able to get more royalties. We'll have just our economics will will be better as a province. But no, in in a perfect world, uh, in the next you know 50 years, when the world is going to use more oil uh, every year, more than it did this last year, we want to be that supplier of safe, ethical oil around the world. Because if it's not, if the oil is not coming from the third largest, it's coming from the second, first, fourth, fifth, and and other countries around the world, and and they will be enriching enriching their people. Um, in the process for, for decades to come. So the more, more capacity is, is obviously needed and, and then obviously more, more production as well. But again, that's, that takes a, a lot of time and, and effort and that's something that we are very committed to uh, to ensure we have increased uh, export capacity, especially on oil. Okay, operator. Thanks, can I, can I ask a follow-up? <laughs> yep, yeah, sure, go ahead. Thanks. Um, just, just in relation to that, I know Premier Smith has, has thrown out about half a dozen um, different project ideas in, in her various public appearances about um, different pipelines and economic quarters that she wants to see advanced, um, everything from the uh, you know, pipe or, or uh, oil shipment from Fort McMurray to Churchill that was discussed earlier to, um, I think, some sort of an economic corridor to Tuktoyuktuk she's mentioned. Um, so I'm wondering, Minister Dreeshen, what, what are you, where are you seeing export challenges and what economic corridors specifically, if you could give us some specific examples, are your priorities right now? So I, 
Parliamentary Secretary Shane Getson for, for years uh, put together a task force and has been looking at economic corridors within Alberta and, and stretching out throughout North America. And, and I think as, as Premier Smith you know, alluded to, whether it's going north or east, pretty much if you look at a compass, it's, it's any direction um, we, getting to Tidewater is, is important for us. And so I think, it, again, these are all private industries and private proposals. And we as, as a government just want to make sure that we have that, that playing field level so that these companies can come in and, and build these projects. So like I said earlier, whether it's a, a pipeline project or a new rail line, uh, utility line, a telecommunication line, we just want to make sure that, that industry views Alberta and views Canada as a place where they can actually build a business and actually develop whatever the product is. So I think that, uh, as, as you mentioned, those, those are examples of, of industry that has actually come to, to the government to say, hey, we would like to do you know, project X, Y, or Z. How could we do it? And we just want to be able to make sure that we have that level playing field so they can do what they do best, which is get global capital, build businesses, create jobs, but we can do what government should do best, which is make a regulatory process that's seamless, that's efficient, and is that actually operates at the speed of business. So that's, again, the, the whole intent of this MOU is to make sure that we have that, that speed of business, that level playing field for, for industry, regardless of the type of project in an economic corridor. Okay, operator, please put through the next caller. Barco, Calgary Herald. Hi, uh, there's already an agreement in place between the Western provinces, the new agreement, and I'm curious how this MOU is different from that. Yeah, for the, the MOU committing each of the provinces to do it. Yeah, for the, the Tilma agreement uh, previously in uh, that, uh, this, this kind of takes it kind of to the next level. And again, as, as we mentioned, uh, having other provinces included as well, so we could uh, ideally get a, a national view of, of all provinces coming together, seeing the importance of, of internal trade, but also of, of external exports and, and trade around the world. So this is, looks specifically, again, at, at economic corridors and to try to harmonize the, the regulations and to make sure that if a project is, has a, a scope outside of a province and, and it goes across the country, that we actually can have the regulatory process set up. So in, again, in a, in a perfect world, it would be just a, a, a checkbox that an industry could come in and say, you know what, we have, these are the, the standards that we have to meet in order to go into this economic corridor. And here, we, can, we can match that, we can do that. So this, again, just helps, it, it advances further agreements, but uh, it's very specific for an economic corridor to make sure that we can have these big nation building projects be built again in Canada, which we haven't seen for, for quite some time. Okay, operator, uh, put through the next caller, please. Josh Aldridge, Calgary Herald. Uh, thank you again. Uh, so is there an understanding how much these uh, I guess challenges uh, when it comes to these economic corridors and trade, uh, that, that it's costing uh, Alberta or Canada uh, every year, how much it's costing us to have these types of delays and roadblocks and challenges in our way that do that, that trying to address through this agreement? Uh, it's, we, we did a very high level estimate of, of billions of dollars of, of economic opportunity loss of, of projects, A, being cancelled, or B, just not viewing Canada as a place that you could have an investment. So uh, the, the numbers are in the billions that uh, this has cost, this regulatory delay and not having economic corridors that are efficient. Uh, in the billions of dollars, it's the cost, and then thousands of jobs. And that's kind of a very high level, but um, we can kind of get more granular of, of, of what the specifics would be. But that's kind of the high level uh, when you look at a lot of projects that, as I said, have been cancelled, or just industry looks at Canada and says, hey, we really like to, but uh, we can't set up shop in Canada because it's just too much of a, a regulatory quagmire to actually advance projects. So that's, uh, that's kind of, that's the problem ultimately that we're, we're trying to solve. Okay, uh, that is all the time we have for questions today. So thank you everyone for being here today and have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. Thanks guys.